Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for taking time out of their day to uh, spend that time with us. Um, and hopefully you folks will benefit with uh, the topic that's going to be covered, which is uh, the management of contaminated containers. What I would ask everyone to do as we begin this presentation, if you would keep yourself on mute, if questions come up as we go through this presentation, I would ask that uh, you reserve those questions until we conclude the presentation. We will have plenty of time at the conclusion of the presentation to answer any questions that come up. So with that, everyone, let's go ahead and begin. So to introduce myself, uh, my name is uh, Steve Ryko. I am a instructor and a consultant here at NES. I've been um, in the Haz Waste handling and management space for over 20 years. Um, and one of those waste streams that I have dealt with throughout my career is contaminated containers, which we will be discussing today. So the three topics that we're gonna discuss are Defining containers. So we're going to begin the presentation with uh, defining what is considered a container under these specific management standards that we're going to look at. And then probably what is most important and in some instances, maybe somewhat subjective. We will look at when the state when California considers a container to be empty. Now, if it is a case that we have a container, which meets the state's definition of empty, those containers are not subject to has waste management standards. However, we do have certain management standards that apply to the management of those empty containers, and that will be the third topic, which will be discussed as we go through this presentation. So, first off, we want to know what is considered and what isn't considered to be a container. So, for the definition of a container, we will refer to Title 22, Section 66260.10. And you'll notice on your presentation in the lower right hand corner there, you see a hyperlink. And you click on that link, this will take you directly to the uh, definitions within Title 22. So in Title 22, our has waste management uh, regulations within the state of California, a container is any device, open or closed and portable in which a material can be stored, handled, treated, transported, recycled or disposed of. So for our definition of container, it is a pretty broad spectrum of what is considered to be a container. It could be anything from a one gallon poly container up to a 40 yard bin. So our container is simply a device, open or closed, portable, which we could put material in to store, handle, treat, transport, recycle, or dispose of. Now, one thing that is not included in this definition of a container, which is one thing that we want to consider when we look at uh, when a container is considered to be empty in the management of those empty containers is this definition does not specify any material construction for those associated containers. And that is relevant because when we discuss what makes a, or, or what constitutes a container to be empty in the management of those empty containers, these standards do not apply to any containers that are made of non-absorbed material in which um, a hazardous material or hazardous waste came in contact with that container made of non-absorbed material. So that's one thing that uh, we will consider moving through this presentation. So we have containers in the state also in Title 22, 66260.10, we have a definition for bulk containers. Now, a bulk container is any container or container-like vehicle other than a vessel or barge with a capacity greater than 119 gallons, which is used to transport hazardous waste, hazardous materials, hazardous substances, 
or recyclable materials in bulk by air, highway, rail, or water. And included in this definition of bulk container is cargo tanks, vacuum trucks, roll-off bins, rail tank cars, and intermodal containers. So we have those containers, and then we also, within our state regulations, define bulk containers. This is also pertinent because when we talk about the management standards, for those empty containers, which again are not applicable to any container which may, which was uh, made of a non-absorbed material, we have different management standards for empty containers based on the capacity of those containers. So that's why it's important that we also define for you not uh, only containers, but also how the state defines bulk containers. Now, as we go through this presentation, the term we're going to use is containers. Now, not to confuse things, but some of you folks might deal with other uh, regulatory requirements. You folks might uh, be involved in shipping or offering for transport uh, materials, which are regulated by DOT. For DOT purposes, DOT does not use the term container but rather DOT uses the term packaging. And for DOT purposes, for uh, packaging, there are two different types. Bulk, which coincides with this definition based on capacity being greater than 119 gallons, and then non-bulk, any container that has a capacity for liquid of 119 gallons or less. So for today's presentation, with the focus being on um, management of these contaminated containers, we're going to defer to DTSC's terminology for transport requirements, um, packaging standards under the Department of Transportation regulations, terminology would uh, be packaging. Now, what is not considered to be a container under the standard that we're going to uh, look at today, today are used oil filters, which are managed in accordance with Title 22, Section 66266.130. So these used oil filters, which would be considered to be a hazardous waste, if they are managed under those management standards spelled out in 66266.130, uh, which requires the filters to be drained, which requires the filters to be reclaimed for their scrap metal value. Those filters would not be subject to has waste management standards, but they are not considered to be a container. Additionally, any uh, PCB equipment or any equipment that is contaminated with PCBs, and PCBs are polychlorinated by phenols. So this could be anything from a uh, ballast that contains uh, PCB oil to a transformer. Those pieces of equipment because of the uh, PCBs or PCB contamination would not be considered to be a container. And then lastly, any uh, uh, chemotherapy uh, IV bags and tubing and that equipment is not considered to be a container. So as such, your used oil filters, any equipment that contains or is contaminated with PCBs, your uh, IV bags and tubing with, uh, that has contained or does contain chemotherapy drugs, do not fall under the standards that we will be discussing this morning. Now, in regards to what constitutes a container as empty? What we need to look at is what was previously contained in that container. So when we talk about empty containers, we're going to focus on what the state determines uh, or when the state determines a container to be empty. Now, one thing that I would uh, caution you folks about our state regulations do not coincide with the federal regulations. Federally, 
Under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, if a container has 3% or less by volume uh, content remaining in that container, that container meets the definition of empty. That 3% rule does not apply in California. For California, the determining factor for when a container is empty is based on whether or not the container held a pourable or a non pourable material. Now, if a container, which also includes a liner, previously contained a pourable hazardous material or hazardous waste, that container or liner is considered to be empty when no material can be poured or drained from the container or liner when held in any orientation. And that includes uh, if the container is tilted or inverted. So, for our purpose of a container or a liner that previously held a hazardous material or hazardous waste, uh, to consider that container to be empty, we just need to empty it. So, if it is tilted or inverted, there is nothing that is poured or drained from that container. So, we are not required to wipe these containers out. We're not required to dry these containers out, nor would we be required to triple rinse these containers. And the state, the Department of Toxic Substances Control has provided guidance regarding containers which meet this definition of empty for those containers that previously contained a portable material. So, one of the uh, documents to support the regulations that we're going through is a fact sheet provided by the state. And within this fact sheet, the state addresses questions that have routinely been raised regarding contaminated containers. And one of the questions addresses those containers that meet this definition of empty, but there still could be some residual material within those containers. And what is stated within DTSC's guidance is specifically as some resi uh, residual material will always remain in the empty container, an inspector inverting the empty container may see some drop strip from the containers. This should not be considered a violation. However, a continuous stream of liquid from the container could be considered to be a violation. So again, to meet this definition of empty, for those containers that held portable, uh, portable material, the intent is that the container does not have to be dry, nor does it have to be triple rinsed, because these empty containers are expected to contain residual material. And as such, if that residual material drips out, that container would still be considered to be empty. But if a continuous stream of liquid would flow from the opening of that container, that container would not be considered to be empty. Now, for containers that previously held a hazardous material or hazardous waste, which is a non-pourable material, those containers are considered to be empty when no material remains in or on the container or liner that can be removed by physical methods. Now, except rinsing, and one thing that we want to consider is in regards to render these containers empty, which previously held a non pourable hazardous material or hazardous waste. We cannot rinse those containers to constitute those containers as empty. And we will discuss um, momentarily the reason being that we are not authorized to rinse these containers. But a physical method could be scraping, it could be grinding, it could be wiping down the contents from within or outside of the container. So, if we employ any of those means to remove the contents of a non-pourable material, 
that would constitute the container is empty. Now, it does become a little more subjective in regards to these containers, which held a non pourable material, because we have to ensure that those containers within them, as well as on the outside of the container, there's no material on on those containers, which could be removed by a physical method, scraping, chipping, grinding, wiping down, whatever the case is. And also what is stated is that following material removal, the top, bottom, and side walls of the container shall not contain remaining adhered or crusted material resulting from buildup of successive layers of material or a mass of solidified material. However, a thin uniform layer of dry material or powder is considered to be acceptable. And what is not explicitly defined is thin. How thin, how thick that uniform layer of dried material or powder is considered to be acceptable constituting uh, the container is empty. And since we do not have definitive guidance on that thin uniform layer, what I would look at is going back to that uh, initial statement is that you wanna ensure that the contents from within and outside that container are removed so that uh, whatever is remaining, that thin uniform layer of material that is remaining on that container cannot be removed by a physical method. It can't be wiped off, it can't be chipped off, it can't be scraped off. So that is when a container which contained a non-pourable material is considered to be empty. Now, what we also wanna look at are containers or liners which previously contained an acute or an extremely hazardous waste. So the first two elements we looked at in regarding uh, those containers containing pourable or non-pourable materials, it was specifically for containers which held a hazardous material or a hazardous waste. Now, if a container previously held a acute or extremely hazardous waste, we have different thresholds for when that container or liner is considered to be empty. To constitute these containers is empty, they have to be triple rinsed by using a solvent capable of removing the waste in all pourable residues have to have been removed from the container or inner liner. If you have a container which previously contained an acute or an extremely hazardous waste, and it is not empty by being triple rinsed and the residue, the pourable residue being removed from that uh, container, that container could not be managed under the contaminated container management standards that we're discussing this morning. That container would be required to be managed as an acute or extremely hazardous waste. And now, in regards to triple rinsing of a container, <clears throat> and again, this is going to be um, addressed in more detail momentarily, but triple rinsing could be considered to be treatment. So it isn't a case where if you had a container which previously contained a acute or extremely hazardous waste that you are authorized to triple rinse that container to constitute it as empty and manage it as such because triple rinsing may be considered to be treatment. Now for cylinders, <clears throat> The regulations say a compressed gas cylinder is exempt from hazardous waste management regulations when the pressure in the cylinder approaches atmospheric pressure. So if you have a cylinder which approaches atmospheric pressure, it doesn't matter what the uh, contents are, what the characteristics are of the uh, material in that cylinder, and that cylinder would be exempt from hazardous waste management regulations.
And then lastly, we want to look at aerosol cans because this is one waste that probably impacts most generators within the state. Now, aerosol containers are considered to be empty when the contents in propellant are emptied to the maximum extent practical under normal use. Given the spray mechanism was not defective and thus allowed the discharge of the contents and propellant. So if you have a aerosol container, which is empty to a maximum stint practical, that aerosol container is not subject to any hazardous waste management standards. It could be discarded as trash. It could be managed as scrap metal. If the aerosol container is not empty, aerosol cans are a waste stream that have been designated to be managed as universal waste. So a aerosol container that is not empty can be managed as universal waste. I will caution you though regarding and this definition of a uh, of empty for aerosol containers. In many instances, an aerosol container at the point you're using it might meet this definition as being empty to the maximum extent practical uh, practical under normal use. However, if that aerosol can is disposed of in the trash especially if it is uh, exposed to heat, if it is rather warm outside, the uh, compressed gas inside that aerosol can may expand, and it very likely could be a case at a later point that aerosol can could remove, uh, be removed from the trash, and because of the heat that that aerosol can was exposed to, there would still be some contents that could be released from the aerosol can if the uh, spray mechanism was depressed. And if an inspector happened to inspect your facility, and even if the case was at the point you disposed of that aerosol can in the trash or a scrap metal bin, it met, it met this definition of empty. When it was retrieved from the uh, trash by the inspector, if any of the contents or propellants were released from it, because that is at the point that it was discovered by the inspector, it would not be considered to be empty. So I would just caution you when you dispose of these empty aerosol cans in the trash that you ensure that they are truly empty. And this will help you avoid any potential uh, penalties or violations for illegal disposal of a hazardous waste. Now, we have our containers and bulk containers. And now for bulk containers, how we consider a bulk container to be empty, the regulations say bulk containers that have held a hazardous waste are empty when they meet those conditions for pourable or non-pourable materials that we looked at. So whether it is a bulk container or a container that previously contained a pourable or non-pourable material, we have to meet the same conditions to consider, to consider that container empty. However, we do have the ability for our bulk containers to be considered empty if the residue is no more than three-tenths of a percent by weight of the total capacity of the container. So this is one area regarding those bulk containers where we do have a specified threshold identified within regulation. So this would allow for uh, some waste to uh, be contained in that bulk container where it would still be considered to be empty. Now, what I had mentioned previously regarding those containers that held non-pourable materials, rinsing those containers out, uh, a container that previously held a acute or an extremely hazardous waste, by triple rinsing those containers, those activities could be considered to be treatment. 
And specifically, if you have a container that does not meet the definition of empty, whether it held pourable, non-pourable material, whether it contained a acute or extremely hazardous waste, uh, whether it was a aerosol can, if we employed any of these activities to empty that container, therefore exempting that container from hazard waste management standards, these activities would be considered to be treatment and they, in some instances, would require your facility to obtain a permit to treat those contaminated containers. In activities which would be considered to be treatment for a contaminated container, would be crushing a container, would be grinding a container, would be puncturing a container, rinsing containers, and shredding containers, those activities are also considered to be treatment. Now, if we have a container that met the condition of being empty though, so it was empty based on that uh, container holding a pourable or a non-pourable material, uh, maybe that container had a acutely or extremely hazardous waste and uh, we didn't triple rinse it to empty it, but we triple rinsed it to remove the contents to be used in a process or to be used for their intended purpose. And by that activity, that container was being empty. If we employed any of these activities to those empty containers, because by those containers being empty, they would be exempt from hazardous waste management standards. These activities would not require a treatment permit. So not that you can't do any of these to a container, but you can't do these activities to a container that is not empty unless you have a permit to perform those activities. And what we want to consider regarding our contaminated containers. So the regulations that we're discussing provide a path for us to uh, manage these containers as a um, recyclable material in most cases, as opposed to a hazardous waste. So we have a path where these containers aren't subject to uh, the same management standards as hazardous waste. So the management standards are more relaxed. However, again, if we dispose of a container that does not meet the condition of emptying the trash, if we treat a container that is not empty and therefore it's not exempt from hazard waste management standards, we could be subject to penalties and violations just like uh, we would be if we illegally disposed of a hazardous waste and or if we illegally treated a hazardous waste. So we want to um, avoid any of these activities if the container is not empty. So in regards to these empty containers, when these containers are empty, these containers are not subject to hazard waste management standards. However, there are still management standards that we have to adhere to in the management standards of these contaminated containers is based on the capacity of the container not whether or not that container held a hazardous material held a hazardous waste a pourable or a non-pourable material but rather based on the capacity of the container so for any contaminated container or liner that has a capacity of five gallons or less and it meets that definition of empty the management standards for these containers are identified on the screen here. That container is exempt from hazard waste management standards when it's empty, and that container is either uh, reconditioned or remanufactured. Or if the container is uh, metal, we reclaim that container for its scrap metal value but also for these containers that have a capacity of five gallons or less 
we are authorized to dispose of these containers in the trash. So if we employ any one of these three uh, recycling or disposal options for our, our containers that are empty with a capacity of five gallons or less, containers are not subject to hazardous waste management standards. So we have to ensure, one, the containers are empty, and two, we apply one of these three management uh, recycling or disposal standards to our containers. Now, for containers or liners that are empty and have a capacity of more than five gallons. So this is inclusive of those containers, not only with a uh, capacity of more than five gallons, but also for bulk containers. So when these containers become empty, the regulations require that the generator of the empty contaminated container mark on that container the date they became empty. Now, in many instances, this is a industry standard. It is not a regulatory requirement. In many standards or many cases, generators will also mark the containers with the word empty. Marking a container empty is not a regulatory requirement. The requirement is specifically that the containers be marked with the date they became empty. And that date is of importance because from that date that container became empty, it can only be accumulated on site by a generator for up to one year. So that date that container became empty, that starts your one year accumulation period. And now, within one year from the date that container became empty, that container has to be recycled in one of these three fashions. It either has to be reclaimed for scrap metal value, it has to be reconditioned or remanufactured, or that container has to be returned to the manufacturer so it could be refilled with hazardous materials, it could be reused. So for our containers that have a capacity of more than five gallons, our management standards are only reserved for one of these three options. Reclaiming it for scrap metal, reconditioning, remanufacturing the container, or returning that container to the manufacturer to be refilled. And also, we're required to mark those containers with the date they became empty, and we're limited from the date those containers to be, uh, which from the date they became empty to accumulate those containers on site for up to one year. Now, additionally, when we generate these containers that have a capacity of more than five gallons, and we mark them with the date they became empty, and we accumulate them on site for up to a year. Within a year, we uh, manage those containers in one of those three fashions, reclaim them for scrap metal value, uh, remanufacture, recondition, send those back to the manufacturer. We are also required to retain documentation on site that has to be retained by the generator for three years from the date these empty containers were sent off site to be recycled. And what is included on this documentation is you have to have the name, street address, mailing address, and telephone number of the facility that you sent your empty containers or liners with the capacity of more than five gallons to, to be recycled. So our five gallon in less containers, it's pretty easy. We can reclaim them or recycle them. We're not required to. We could throw them in the trash. We don't have to label them. We're not subject to that one year accumulation period. We don't have any record keeping requirements. But those containers and liners that have capacity of five gallons or more, we have the marking requirements, uh, which requires us to mark the date the containers became empty. We have the one year accumulation period. The containers cannot be disposed of in the trash, but rather they have to be recycled and we have to keep records to identify 
where those containers were sent to be recycled. And these four elements are the specific information that must be retained on those recycle records. Now, what I would like to do at this point is open it up and see if anyone has any questions regarding management of contaminated containers. Oh, okay. Watch glasses, vials, lab way, labware, test tubes, pipette tips that once contacted hazardous material but are dry with no visible or residual material, not container subject to hazardous waste, disposed of trash or glass waste. Um, if that glassware met the definition of a container and it was dry and it was empty, I would absolutely consider that to be a container. Now, a pipette might be a little more subjective, uh, but if we go back to that definition of a container, uh, hazardous material held, transported, treated, recycled, disposed of, I don't think necessarily in all instances a pipette may be used for those instances. It could be, it could be. And if uh, it could be, or it routinely is, I would say that that lab glassware, pipettes, um, test tubes, vials, I would consider those to be containers. And if they were empty, given that they did not contain a acute hazardous waste or an extremely hazardous waste, I would think it would be more than appropriate to dispose of those containers in the trash. Is remanufacturing the same as recycling? I would say yes. Now, in regards to remanufacturing, uh, reconditioning containers, specifically that container is not going to be shredded and uh, turned into another uh, container or piece of equipment. But I think uh, remanufacturing would be considered to be recycling. So if I had a poly container, if I sent that poly container offsite to be uh, recycled because of uh, the plastic content, I would consider that if it had a capacity of more than five gallons to be remanufacturing. Manufacturing, why do some facilities puncture aerosol cans after empty before placing in trash? Is that necessary? or permissible per regulations. Why do some facilities puncture aerosol cans after empty before placing in trash? I would assume that that is being done to verify that that aerosol can is empty. That is not necessary, nor would I think necessarily that that would be something that is permissible. Now, you are authorized to puncture aerosol cans that are not empty without obtaining a hazardous waste treatment permit. In the standards that uh, you have to comply with for uh, processing those aerosol cans are not addressed within Title 22. However, they are addressed within California Health and Safety Code, Section 25201.16. Now, puncturing these aerosol cans in accordance with those statutes laid out in the Health and Safety Code is not as simple as taking a uh, screwdriver or a sharp object and puncturing those aerosol cans. You actually have to have uh, equipment that is specifically designed to puncture the aerosol cans. You have to capture the content that is uh, released from puncturing those aerosol cans. The contents has to be properly characterized and in most cases would be considered to be a RICRA or a federal hazardous waste. You have to have procedures in place. You have to train employees and you have to notify your inspector, the Certified Unified Program Agency, prior to processing those aerosol cans. 
And the reason I say that it is not necessary or would not necessarily be permissible per regulations is that if a inspector found a punctured aerosol can in the trash, unless you were clearly able to demonstrate that that aerosol can was punctured after it was empty, the assumption was that uh, possibly you punctured that aerosol can prior to it being empty. And unless you follow those specific standards within the health and safety code, that also could be considered to be illegal treatment. Good question, thank you. Uh, we use large plastic sheets under construction equipment during storage and or rep uh, repair. What would be the proper way to dispose of that? It contains oil, grease, and waste. Now, that sheeting used under equipment, I would not consider that to be a liner because within these standards, um, it may be similar in regards to a liner. It may be uh, same material, but the liners are specifically uh, those liners within a container. So that uh, sheeting that you use under equipment that is contaminated with oil, grease, or other automotive type waste, California would uh, presume that to be a hazardous waste. And short of doing testing, to determine that that does not exhibit a hazardous waste characteristic as a presumptive hazardous waste, I would recommend that that waste be managed as a non-RICRA hazardous waste, a California regulated hazardous waste, just like you would manage any um, absorbent material that you would apply to oil or fuel spills to absorb and contain those spills. We puncture our aerosol cans to ensure they, they're empty because sometimes they don't empty out completely. Any material that is released and collected for disposal is this compliant. Um, it, as mentioned, it would only be compliant if you follow those standards within the health and safety code. And again, that uh, section is 25201.16. And there are specific activities that you have to follow. You have to have a specific piece of equipment that is designed to puncture those aerosol cans. You have to collect the contents. You have to characterize the contents. You have to have procedures. You have to train employees. Um, you also have to have a spill kit in the area where that uh, puncturing of aerosol cans is um, occurring. And you have to notify your Coupa in writing that you are performing that activity. If you don't follow those requirements, that is not a compliant activity. And because that aerosol can is not empty, that would uh, be a potential violation for illegally treating hazardous waste. So I would not recommend that you perform any of those activities until you had a chance to review the health and safety code and you could ensure that you're following all those applicable standards. Uh, aerosol can with a clock spray nozzle that is not empty must be disposed of. Would puncturing that container in a puncturing station be considered treatment? Yes, it is treatment. Puncturing those aerosol cans absolutely is treatment. However, not in every single instance is a permit required for treating waste. And that is one of those activities, puncturing those aerosol cans. Again, I have to reiterate this one more time. As long as you follow those standards within the health and safety code, that activity does not require a permit. Doesn't mean that it is not treatment, but it does not require a permit to perform that activity. But again, you have to follow those standards within the health and safety code. We test products including aerosol, non-aerosol in our lab and we'll puncture possibly rinse out those containers that were completely tested and then we get the rest back half full, et cetera, would you consider needing a permit? Um, rinsing containers 
to constitute those containers as empty. I would see possibly as a treatment activity. I'm not uh, addressing aerosol cans, but if I had a container, whether or not that container held a pourable or non-pourable material, if my intent was to rinse or triple rinse that container to constitute that container as empty, I would consider that to be a treatment activity. That is something that I would not recommend because not only could that be uh, considered treatment, but also ultimately what you're doing is you are generating a new hazardous waste stream, which is not going to be exempt from has waste management standards. So that rinse aid that you're generating from rinsing those containers, um, you're generating a new waste stream which is not going to be exempt in most cases from house waste management standards. So that is not a activity that I would recommend. However, it is specifically required for those containers that contained a acute or extremely hazardous waste to constitute those containers as empty. Doesn't mean that that activity is not considered to be treatment, but that is the only means in which those containers would be considered to be empty. One thing not addressed in this presentation are pesticide containers. Now, within these regulations in Title 22.261.7, it addresses pesticide containers for home use. However, pet unrinsed pesticide containers in California are presumed to be a hazardous waste. And for a pesticide container, to be considered to be empty, that pesticide container must be triple rinsed. Now, in most instances, the triple rinsing of a pesticide container is not considered to, uh, to be treatment, but rather that container is being rinsed to remove any residue, any usable product from that pesticide container, which then typically is transferred into some sort of pesticide applicator so it's actually used for its intended purpose as opposed to triple rinsing the container and generating another waste stream of the rinse egg. But for those pesticide containers, unless they're uh, triple rinse, California presumes those to be um, hazardous waste. What are your thoughts on the temperature considerations for pourability of a hazardous waste? Greases or waxes can drip at high enough temperature, but not pour as a stream. Would that fall under scrape clean and it's considered empty? Good question. Our regulations are not always consistent in each cases. Um, we do not define pourable versus non-pourable. There is free-flowing liquid defined within the Title 22 regulations, which is a liquid that pours through a paint filter. And uh, based on that definition of free-flowing liquid, that is the definition that I would apply to a pourable material for the purposes of our containers, which previously held a hazardous material or hazardous waste. So I would consider a container which held a material that could pour through a paint filter as being a pourable uh, material in the case of a grease or a wax, which as it gets uh, heated up may become uh, more pourable. I would consider that to be a non-pourable material and uh, scraping Wiping those containers would be the practice that I would employ to consider those containers to be empty. Disposal records have to be kept for all drones and totes over five gallons for three years. For empty containers that were contaminated with the hazardous material or hazardous waste, if those containers are disposed of, they're not exempt from house waste management standards. So if you are disposing of your contaminated containers, you would um, probably have a uniform hazardous waste manifest for sending off those containers to be disposed of. That manifest record would be required for three years. If you are recycling 
your containers uh, with a capacity of five gallons or uh, more, you would need some sort of record. It wouldn't be a manifest, it could be a bill of lading, um, some receipt or document that shows where, including street address, mailing address, and telephone number where those containers were sent to be recycled. That record only has to be retained on site. It does not have to be submitted to any regulatory agency. But if you are inspected, you do have to provide a copy of that uh, recycle record on request um, to an inspector. All right, now it looks like those questions have been addressed. However, NES, we are here. We can support you with any of your training needs, consulting needs. If there's any services that uh, you think that uh, we could assist you with to help you come into compliance or maintain compliance at your facility, we would appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Our web address is uh, listed uh, underneath our logo and uh, company phone number is listed on this slide. If there's any questions of me, and what I'm going to do in the chat box is send you a copy of my email address. And if you have any questions after the fact, you could reach uh, directly out to the company. You could email me. I would be more than happy to help you out any way I can. The one thing that I would ask in return for you folks uh, taking this time out of your day with us, hopefully gaining some valuable information that you could uh, take back to your facility and apply, is that if you would click on the link in the chat box, take 30 or 60 uh, seconds of your time to fill out a uh, evaluation, provide any feedback on the presentation, the content, the presenter, that would be greatly appreciated by us if you took uh, time to provide your feedback. Other than that, hopefully uh, you folks got something out of this presentation that will help you um, comply with those applicable regulatory standards at your facility. I hope everyone stays dry and has a wonderful weekend. Thank you for your time.